Well, this is a very important question. Who am I? Now, if you're like me, getting a little along in years, I'm 55 years old, I look in the mirror sometimes, I go, oh my goodness, who am I? Uh, and I remember what I looked like when I was a kid or when I was younger, and I look at my college friends online, and I'm like, man, these people are getting old, all right? So this is not what this series is about, all right? That's not about that at all. And it's, if you're looking for one of these kind of um, moralistic, therapeutic deism, all right, isn't that a mouthful? Moralistic, therapeutic deism. What is that? Uh, it's the idea that uh, God wants you to be a good little boy, a good little girl. That's kind of what your relationship with God is based on, your deeds, your actions, what you're good at, how good you are. And it's just about making you feel good. God is uh, the heavenly servant with a towel draped over his arm just to do whatever it is that you ask, whatever it is that you want. And his ultimate purpose is to make you happy. And his job is to be the giant ATM in the sky. And every once in a while, you don't need him in your life all the time. But every once in a while, when you have a need or a want or desire, whatever, you go to him and he pulls the lever and the big old gift drops out of heaven and you're fine. That's moralistic, therapeutic deism. All right, so that is not what the gospel is about. I just want you to understand that. The gospel is about something completely different. So, um, if you're looking for just kind of a therapeutic, kind of make me feel good kind of series, well, this may not be for you. I will say this. I guarantee you that if you listen to this series and you listen to every message in this series, you are going to feel better. There's no doubt about that because you cannot look at the bottom line, the truth of the gospel, and learn more about Jesus without being better, without feeling better, without being in a better spot. It's just impossible. You know, I'm not a prosperity gospel uh, preacher, but I defy you, I dare you to find somewhere in the Bible that when you give your life to Jesus Christ and you pursue him with all of your heart, show me an area of your life that is not better because of it. Well, if I give, the reason I give is not to get. That's not, that's not the point. But when I'm generous, God blesses me. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. Uh, When I follow biblical principles in my marriage, is my marriage better or worse? Well, it's better. Uh, If I follow biblical principles in my relationships at work, is is my job better or worse? Well, it's better. And so the point is not that the gospel is about making you feel good. It's not. The gospel is about making you in right standing with God, which should make you feel good. All right? The fact is when I understand the gospel— And the implications on my life. Yes, it's in eternity and throughout all of eternity, God is going to be pouring out his grace and his mercy and his blessings on me. However, it's not about the sweet by and by only. It's about the nasty now and now as well. And what God does, that the the word of God, the kingdom of God begins now. And so this series, Who Am I? We're going to discover who we are by finding out what Jesus says you are, all right? So that's what this is really about. What does God say about you? Now, I must say this. Uh, For many people, their past is what defines them. You ever notice that? They believe that what they were is who they are destined always to be, and that's simply not true. In fact, I'm going to be talking about this next week. The Bible says that if anyone is in Christ, you are a new creation. The oldest past, the new has come. Beautiful. But the fact is, what God wants you and me to understand is what he says about us. What he declares about us. What he says are promises to us. And when I begin to understand that, then I can leave the past under the blood of Jesus Christ. And I can say, I may not be what I ought to be, but thank God I'm not what I used to be. And one day, I'm going to be everything God wants me to be. And so um, this series is really about getting your eyes on Jesus. It's about theology. Now, I know some of you, you hear that and you're like, oh, no, I don't want to be bothered with theology. Well, yes, you do. The fact is, everybody's interested in theology. Now, when you hear the word theology, you probably think about some dry professor Uh, His hair is kind of wild looking. He's got spectacles on, and he's teaching you about things that you have absolutely no idea what he's talking about, and you have really no interest in what he's saying, 
All right? That's not, see, theology simply means the study of God. Learning about God. And the Bible tells us that God has put eternity in the human heart. Every human being has a desire for God. Now, whether they reject him or not is a different story. Whether or not they receive him into life is a different story. But every person, every human is born with this desire to connect with God, to know more about God. That's theology. That's all it is. It's learning about God. When I learn that God is with me, when I learn that, you know what I'm learning? I'm learning theology. I'm learning about the nature of God. I'm learning about who God is and what he promises to me. But I can promise you that learning about the fact that God is with me in the middle of my storm, learning about the fact that God will never leave me no matter what's going on in my life, that God is always going to be there, that he is Jehovah Shammah, the Lord who is there, and that God himself sent Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to this earth to be Emmanuel, God with us. Well, the more I learn about the fact that God is with me, he never leaves me, the better off I am. And the more I learn about myself and the more I learn about my relationship with God. So that's what this series is about. And over the next several weeks during the summer, we're going to be talking about this. And every week, we're going to make a declarative statement about who you are and who God says you are and the implications of that in your life. All right, so we're going to begin today, and we're going to talk about this answer to the question, who am I? We're talking about I am loved. I am loved. I want everybody to say that out loud together with me. Ready? I am loved. Everybody say it again now like you mean it. I am loved. Now, once again, the point of this is not feel-good theology. The point of this is to get you to Jesus, to get you to understand who he is, how much he loves you, how that when you follow him and obey him, it changes your life. It blesses your life. And when we start with this base, I believe one of the most important characteristics of God is that he is love. There are a few things that the Bible says God is. And then there are some things that he has. Did you know the Bible never says that God is wrath or anger? It says he is love. Now, he will have wrath, yes. He will judge sin, and he ultimately did it through Jesus Christ by putting all the sin of the world on him when he died for us on the cross, okay? But the fact of the matter is, what you and I need to understand is that uh, God loves us. He loved us so much that he sent his son, Jesus, to die on the cross for our sins so that we would be made right with God. This is not about morality. Jesus didn't come to make you a better guy or a better girl. Now, you should keep the commandments, don't get me wrong, all right? You know, we we talk about this, that it's not about keeping the commandments that makes you right with God. Nobody's suggesting you don't keep the Ten Commandments. I mean, you know, you leave here and say, well, Pastor Rich, you said uh, don't keep the Ten Commandments. I'm going to go shoot somebody this afternoon. No, that's not what I'm saying. Believe that you ought not to steal, that you ought not to commit adultery, that you ought not to covet, and you ought to honor your parents. So, I mean, we're not suggesting that you don't keep the Ten Commandments. What you're saying is this. That it's not about your behavior, it's not about your morality that makes you right with God. Should you be a moral person? Yes. Should you pursue Jesus in that way? Yes. But that's not what gets you there. And I will tell you this, and I've learned this in my life as a believer and as a pastor. The more I make it about my effort, my struggle, my strain, my discipline, the more I fail to keep the very things that, I, that I'm pursuing. The more difficult it becomes, the more I focus on my sin, the more I sin. It's crazy. And there are so many Christians that are frustrated because of that, because they do not understand the nature of the gospel. Though they know, yeah, Jesus died on the cross, he was buried and rose from the grave for my sins, and if I say the sinner's prayer, he's going to take me to heaven when I die. But What you and I need to understand, ladies and gentlemen, is that the nature of who God is, the nature of the gospel, the nature of Jesus Christ is so radically and overwhelmingly uh, invasive and pervasive in our life when we follow Christ as our Savior, when we understand the true meaning of the gospel and how it applies to us and what God says about us, it changes everything. Changes everything. Well, today we're going to read uh, from the letter of 1 John. 
Now, for those of you that are joining us online, those of you that are here in the room today, there may be some of you that are new to Christian faith, or maybe you haven't really studied that much about it. And so a lot of things you might have questions about. One question might be, why are there so many Johns in the New Testament? Uh, Well, there's the Gospel of John, which is written by, losing the name, folks, John. All right, so uh, if it said the Gospel of Richie, it would not have been written by John. It would have been written by Richie, okay? And please don't, I'm not suggesting that I've written a part of the Bible, okay, because I haven't. But, you know, the Gospel of John, and then 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, or as some people might say, 1, 2, and 3 John. All right, that, that's just simply letters from the Apostle John. Now, you say, who was the Apostle John? Well, you remember when Jesus was here on earth, um, he had multitudes that followed him. Some of the recorded uh, number of people in the Bible we can estimate uh, with what they said with just men present, not including women and children. We know of at least 20,000 people that would hear Jesus at one time in some of his sermons. Okay, very huge following. And uh, so he had the crowds, and he loved them. But then there were his disciples. Now, I'm not talking about the 12 disciples. Uh, Did you know that there were men and women both that followed Jesus like disciples wherever he went? In fact, there were even some women that uh, funded uh, his ministry. All right, And they traveled with him, and these were other disciples. But then there were the 12 disciples. You know, you've you've heard of those guys, right? Um, The 12 disciples disciples, but it didn't just stop there. Of those 12, three were the closest to Jesus. They were the inner circle. Uh, They were the ones that hung out with Jesus most. They knew him. They saw him. They ate with him. They touched him. And John was one of those three. Now, if I'm going to have anybody tell me about a person, If I'm going to learn about you and I've never met you, my first step is probably not going to be to look up your Facebook profile. Now, that may be some people's first step. Maybe you can learn a little about it. But you're not really going to learn much about a person by looking at Facebook. I mean, you won't learn much good. All right, I'll say it that way. The fact is, you can learn a lot of bad uh, and say, well, that person has very poor judgment because they should not have put that on their profile. Um, But if I want to really know a person... I'm going to listen to a person that was actually there. Actually there. I used to talk to my great-grandmother. And um, she was born in 1893 or 4, I believe it was. And she died at almost 100 years old. Uh, Our oldest daughter, Brittany, was born, and she was still alive. We had a picture with uh, her, my grandmother, my dad, me, uh, and and Brittany, our oldest daughter. Uh, Kind of a cool thing. But I can remember her telling me about things when she was young. Uh, She was an adult before she ever saw a car. She was an adult plus some before she ever saw an airplane in the sky. Uh, She was born in a place with no electricity, no running water. I mean, so if you want to find out what it was like back then, oh, yeah, we can look at some books and some movies. But talking to a person that was actually there, I would say it's a whole lot better, wouldn't you? Well, what we're doing here is we're hearing from the person that was actually there, that actually touched Jesus, that actually hung out with him, that went with him wherever he went. And I I would say that I'm going to trust that guy, that his account is probably pretty accurate. So begin with me in 1 John chapter 2, uh, verse 28, and we're going to read through chapter 3, verse 3. Not very many verses, but as I've told you before, verses were added later that they divided it so that we could find it, okay? Uh, but he writes this as a paragraph, all right? So I want you to read it together with me. He says, and now little children, abide in him, abide in Jesus, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him uh, in, in his, uh, from him in his, in shame, rather, in his, in his coming. Now, let me say this. He's talking about the return of Christ. Jesus is coming again. And I think the application is whether you die first or whether Jesus comes first, we want to be confident that when we stand before him, we can know, all right, that you've got confidence that you're not ashamed, that you understood that it's not about you, but about Jesus and his grace and mercy. 
And when you get that, you don't have to be ashamed. You don't worry. You're not afraid of dying. You may not want to die right now, but you're, you're not afraid of it. You know that when you die, you're going to You know that he is righteous. You may be sure. And I'm just going to kind of get a little preacher right here. The fact is, we need to be sure about some things. You ever notice that when a person is not sure, it doesn't matter what they're doing. They just don't do well. If they're not sure trying to sing and uh, try out for something, man, it's a mess. If they're not sure when they're trying to lead a group, maybe as a manager or a leader in their company, man, they're breaking out, sweating like bullets, and they look like they're so uncomfortable, right? They're not sure. But boy, you get somebody that's sure. They know. I mean, they know it from the top of their head down to the bottom of their feet. It makes a difference, does it? There are some things we need to be sure of. And when you get sure of them, Oh, it makes your life so much better. It makes your understanding of who God is so much better. He said, if you know that Jesus is righteous, you can be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. And then here's actually what you call the imperative statement in this paragraph, in these verses. It's found in this next verse. It says, see what kind of love the Father has given to us. All right, so that's really the main thought there in, the, in, that, in those words, in those sentences. See what kind of love the Father has given us. So what John is saying is, guys, you got to see this. you got to see the love of God. you got to see how much he loves you. And so it's a command. So that tells me that if it's something that we're commanded to do, that this is actually an imperative statement, if this is something that is not a suggestion, if this is something that is a command, it tells me that we have the option of not doing it. And if we're not careful, we won't do it. Very easy to get our eyes off the love of God and the plan of God and look at the world around us, isn't it? I mean, look at the situation we're in right now in our nation. Man, it's really easy to get... It's really easy to be offended it's really easy to have fear. It's easy to do that. But he says, I want you to see. I want you to look at this. Do it on purpose. Recognize it, he says. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, I want you to see that. We are God's children now. Once again, if you're living this life as if God is not important, as if you don't have time for him or relationship with him, you're missing out on this implication of the gospel that the Christian life, that eternal life, doesn't begin when you die. It begins when you believe. He says, we are God's children now. Now. Did you know that now you can have the promises of God? That now you can have victory over sin? That now God will lead your life and he will bless you when you trust him and follow him? I have a relationship with God. I am a follower of Jesus. Now. Now. That, by implication, tells me that what I do is important. The decisions I make, the life that I live, very important. The choices that I make, very important. Why? Because I'm a child of God now. Not just when I get to heaven, but now. He said, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. I don't know about you, but I can't wait for that time. He's talking about your resurrected body. Now remember, for those of you that maybe are not familiar with what the Bible teaches about this, Jesus died on the cross, was buried, rose from the grave. But he's coming again. And in the meaning, the implication of understanding eternal life is the resurrection of the body. When Jesus comes again, those that have died that are believers in Christ are going to have a resurrected body like Jesus had 
after he resurrected from the grave. Those of us that are still alive, if any of us are, when Jesus comes again, we're going to be changed. All right? We won't taste death, but we'll be changed, and we will have at that moment a resurrected body. Be, but he says we're going to be like him. You know what Jesus' body was like after he resurrected? It's interesting. He was not, he was not constrained by time or space. In the Gospels, it tells us that after he resurrected, uh, the disciples were in a house that everything was locked and closed, and all of a sudden, Jesus appeared in the midst of them. And he said, peace be in you. <laughs> he better say that, because I tell you, it would scare me out of my pants. I mean, if somebody just appeared in the room like that. So he obviously was not constrained by time or space. At the ascension in the book of Acts, he ascended to the Father. Now, we know a little bit about space, and the fact that, you know, some stars are, what, millions of light years of, away? Uh, some billions of light years away? Well, if that were the case, if Jesus was constrained by time and space, he would not be at the side, the right hand of the Father now, but he is, okay? So uh, that body could eat. He ate with his disciples after he was resurrected. They recognized him some of the time. Some of the times they did not. And so my point is this. We're going to have a resurrected body. And in that body, we will live throughout all of eternity, bringing glory to God. Because, you see, part of the plan of the gospel is this, and we need to understand this. It's not just about getting saved. It's not just about a fire escape insurance policy. Oh, I, you know, I don't want to go to hell when I die. Okay, yeah, I'll do this. That's not the thing. It is about the resurrected life, that life that God is going to set back to its original order. Just like when he created Adam and Eve in the garden, he said, and everything was good. God, when he comes back, when Jesus comes back, is going to restore the world to its original order. That's why it talks about that during that time, the lion will lay down with the lamb. And we see those kinds of prophecies in the Old Testament. So, he says, when we shall, he uh, shall appear, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Now, why would I talk about this series, especially beginning with this topic, I am loved? Well, the fact is, when you begin to understand the nature of this, it changes your outlook. It changes your attitude. It changes your response. It changes the way you handle life. It changes everything. You've heard me say before, the most important thing about you is what you believe about God. And if you understand the nature of what God is promising us when he says that we are loved, and this is a guy that was with Jesus that recorded this, and he knew Jesus better than any of us, and he said, just trust me, he loves you. He loves you. And when I begin to understand that I am loved, it radically changes everything. It's kind of like the, the grandpa that he always liked to take a nap on Sunday afternoons. And his grandkids were going to play a trick on him one day. And he was laying on the couch just kind of snoring away on his Sunday afternoon nap. And his grandkids got some Limburger cheese and just kind of rubbed into his mustache there above his uh, lip. And, of course, if you know, that stuff smells really, really bad. And he, he kind of snorted and woke up. He goes, man, this room stinks. And uh, they kind of giggling, and he laughed, or they laughed, and he got up, and he walked into the kitchen. He goes, man, I think this whole house stinks. And then he went outside, and he said, man, I'm pretty sure the whole world stinks. You know, there are a lot of people that their past or who they think they are clouds their understanding of what God has declared about them, and they think the whole world stinks. They think everything is bad. They think everything is without hope, but it's not so. Let me show you just three quick points, and I won't be very long with this, how that you and I can see God's love. John told us, this is a command. Folks, you got to do this. See God's love. Three things from this passage I want to show you. Number one, I see God's love by remaining in Jesus. He said, abide in him. Now, what does that mean? Abiding in Jesus means resting in him. You receive him as your Savior. Uh, you read the Bible, all right? That's what it means. Uh, when I receive him, I'm abiding in him. When I rest in him, I'm trusting in his grace. I'm remember You know how you abide in Jesus? You just you get to know more about him. You, you read the Bible learn more about Jesus. And the more I learn about that, the closer I am to him then. Does that make sense? And he says, abide in me. Trust in me. 
abide in this place where I have challenged you in your faith. And abide in me. I told you that I would be with you no matter what. I know the circumstances look bad right now. And I know you're afraid. But abide in me. Trust in me. I know that things are bleak financially for you right now. But I've promised that I am the Lord who provides. So abide in me. Stay right there. Trust me. So what John told us to do is to abide in Jesus. Learn more about him. I want you to read what Jesus said about abiding In John 15, he said, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. You see, that's God's goal for your life, that you bear much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you. By the way, this is why it's so important to read the Bible. This is why it's so important to get you some promises of God's word and just believe them and pray them and quote them. You know why? Because the living word of God then courses through your veins and there is power in that. Some of you have fears that you've never been able to overcome. And I would suggest to you, when you start getting some Bible promises, some Bible verses, and you start letting the living Word of God course through your veins and course through your mind, it's going to change your fear. And you're going to go from fear to faith. And you're going to trust Jesus. And that's what God tells us, is that we've got to abide in Him. And He says, when you do that, you can ask anything you desire And it will be done for you. So I I see God's love by remaining in Jesus. Number two, I see God's love by having confidence in Jesus. It says, when he appears, we may have confidence. We can have the confidence of our salvation. Now, there are many. The confidence of your salvation. Once again, John said, you can be sure of some things. When I was eight years old, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. After church on a Wednesday night, my mom prayed with me, and suddenly I began, she asked me if I was a Christian, if I loved Jesus or whatever. I just started crying, and I prayed there right beside my bed and received Christ as my Savior. It is a beautiful thing. But there was a period in my life that I had real doubts and I really struggled. And the real reason, I'm going to kind of give you the real reason behind it. I saw this 70s Christian movie called The Burning Hell. And I would challenge you, if you want a glorious afternoon, get on YouTube and look up Burning Hell film uh, made by the Orman brothers, okay? Um, I'm actually in it. You won't be able to find me. I'm actually in that. But I saw this film. It's about these two motorcycle guys, and they had a wreck, and one of them died. And he went to hell. And... You know, in the 70s, they had B-movies. You you know B-movies? Sorry, you know what that is? I don't know that they had C-movies, but if they did, this would be a C-movie, all right? It wasn't even good enough to be a B-movie. And it was hokey, but it scared the ever-living daylights out of me. And for a period of about two years, I was like, well, just in case I'm not saved, Lord, save me tonight before I go to bed. And I got, every time I got scared of something, I'd be like, oh, Lord, save me, just in case, you know. And I wasn't sure. But I'll never forget my mom telling me, and I was really struggling with this. And she said, do you believe that God can lie? I said, well, no, I don't. She said, well, he promised that once he saves you, you'll always be a child of his. You'll always be saved, right? Yes. Do you believe that? Yes. If Jesus, do you believe Jesus? Yes. Did Jesus promise always to be with you and never to leave you when you follow him? Yes. And my mom said this, and it made sense. Well, if Jesus never leaves you, it means that if you were to go to hell, that Jesus would have to go with you. And if Jesus went, it wouldn't be hell. And I'm like, in my little brain, I was like, that makes sense to me. And I want to just tell you that until you get sure, you're going to struggle in your Christian life. You're going to struggle with your faith. You're going to struggle with your feelings about your circumstances and about God. You're going to struggle with uh, fairness. You're going, to, uh, uh, you're going to struggle with discouragement and all kinds of problems until you are sure. And God says you can know. You can be sure. 
You can be confident. So you believe in that, it gives you confidence of your salvation. If I had time, I could really go through this list and get you fired up. Let me just kind of highlight it a little bit. Uh, we can have prom, uh, confidence in God's promises. He's promised to love us, yes, but I can have hope because of his love. Because no matter what circumstance I face, no matter how many people may reject me or turn their back on me, I am loved through Jesus Christ. And I can have hope because of that. I can have confidence because of his love. I am bold because of his love. If I know that he is with me, that he never leaves me or never forsakes me, then I'm okay. I'm going to go ahead and take the next step. I'm going to keep on keeping on. I'm fearless because of his love. Oh, my goodness. God promises uh, to bless me. I can have courage because of his love. I'm in union with Christ because of his love. I know I'm saved because of his love. I am growing because of his love. I have overcome fear because of his love. I am accepted because of his love. And I'm a child of God because of his love. And the point is this, when I begin to understand Jesus and his promises and his declarations about me, then I can know I'm loved. And then here's the last thing. I see God's love, and this is very important, by growing in Jesus. Growing in Jesus. A lot of people think that what they need is a little bit of Sunday religion. They get just enough, they'll go often enough on Sundays to keep their appetite in check. And, um, you know, they get a little bit of Christianity. And I would suggest they get enough just to make them miserable. Because a lot of people get just enough Christianity, they get the don't side of it that they were raised with, and they, they don't really understand the gospel. And so they got just enough Christianity to make them miserable, you know. Because what they think Christianity is is a bunch of things you can't do. Under no circumstances shalt thou have any fun. And who would want to be a part of that? That's, that's, that's horrible. But the fact is, ladies and gentlemen, you and I can be sure. We can be sure because we grow in Jesus. We can see his love because we grow in him. Two words, salvation and sanctification. Now I realize those are kind of seminary sounding words. And I pay tens of thousands of dollars for my education and I'm giving it to you for free. You're, you're welcome. All right. So, uh, look, those two words are very important. Salvation. That's when God puts you in right standing with him, when you receive Jesus as your Savior. You know what that is. Some of you may not know what sanctification is. That's just a fancy word that means you're growing in your relationship with the Lord. You're maturing in Christ. You're getting more like Jesus. That's all it means. And you're understanding more and more. And he told us that when we grow in our faith, when we begin to understand how we're growing in our faith, we begin to mature. We begin to understand his love more. We begin to follow Jesus more. We begin to understand how overwhelming his grace is. He says, if you know that he is righteous... And by the way, that's the key, knowing that he is righteous, not you. I'm going to be talking about I am righteous next week. You do not want to miss this message. I think it's going to be a blessing to you. But we know that he is righteous because of who he is. And the more I get my eyes on him and the more I understand that he is righteous and that he is right and that he has a plan and that he sees everything and that he knows all and that he understands everything, then I'm like, okay, I can relax a little bit in this world. I can rest a little bit. I can breathe. I can breathe out. By the way, that was, I did not say that on purpose uh, for anybody that may have been offended by that. I realize the political context that we're in and the, uh, the man that uh, w had his life taken and he said he couldn't breathe. I, that was a faux pas on my part. That was absolutely unintended. So, but the fact is, as a believer in Christ, you can have freedom and joy and liberty, okay? And so, what does God say to us. He says that we are God's children now and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. That word purify just simply means that you're growing in Christ. It doesn't mean you're perfect, but it means that you strive to grow in your relationship with him. Okay. 
And so what I want to challenge you to do today is to focus in on this truth, not on yourself, but on Jesus. I am loved. He has declared it to be true. He has demonstrated his love by dying on the cross for me. And I am loved. I am loved. Heavenly Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you'd help us all to believe this. Help us to see it like John said that we're to. We're to see it. We're to practice it. We're to recognize it. And God, I pray that you'd help us to live it. God, we want you to know today that we love you. And God, I pray that you will bless every member in our church, every person here today, every person joining us online. Lord, in our world, there's so much fear. There's so much work that needs to be done. There, there's so much um, tension between so many people. And God, I pray that you'd help people to know and to see that the hope for the world is Jesus. The hope for the world is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the only thing that can take hate out of a person's heart. It is the only thing that can give hope uh, to people, no matter who they are or where they are. And God, I pray that you'd help our people in this country to see that. I pray that you would uh, bless those that are pursuing a just and righteous cause. I, I pray that you'd bless them and, and be with them. And Lord, for those that are just trying to destroy our country or trying to uh, make people afraid or for very selfish reasons or stirring up anarchy and things of that nature, Lord, I pray that you'd help it to be deal with, Lord, dealt with. Lord, you, you said that uh, we're to leave these things to you, and I pray that you would deal with it and take care of it. But Lord, we pray for our country. And we pray for our people. And God, I pray especially for Avalon Church. God, that you'd help everyone here to know that they are loved. They're loved by you. They're loved by Jesus. They're loved by me, and they're loved by this church. And God, we want you to know that we love you today, and we want to say that uh, you are our Lord and our King and our blessing, and we thank you that you're our Heavenly Father, and that Jesus, you are our Savior. Of course, in Jesus' name, we pray and, and say all these things. Amen. I wonder today, would you like to receive Christ as your Savior? You're loved. Whether you realize it or not, you are loved. And God tells us that you can be made right with Him simply by putting your faith in Jesus Christ. And that's my prayer for you today. I hope you will do that. If you don't know what to do, I want to encourage you to say a prayer something like this. Remember, it's an act of faith. It's declaring your faith in Christ. Dear Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross and rose from the grave. And I'm asking you right now to save me, to come into my life and change me. And I'm asking you to, to make me born again, to give me new life, to help me to become a follower of Jesus. And I thank you for that. Friend, if you prayed that and you're watching online, would you click at the bottom to let us know that you received Christ today? If in the service here you pray to receive Christ or you would like to, take one of the Next Step cards, put your name on it, and check on there that you uh, received Christ, check salvation today, and drop it in the drop box on the way out, and uh, we'll help you take your next step. If you want to fill out a Next Step card, either online or here in person, we encourage you to do that. If you'd like to sign up for our Next Step class, or for church membership, or for any of these things, we encourage you to take your next step as well. Well, as we end our service today, as always, we have an opportunity for you to give. And for those of you present in the room today, uh, and once again, it's so good to see your face today. And I can't wait to see more and more of you each week. We have more and more people coming every week. And so it's exciting. I can't wait to see you. Um, but you can give in four ways if you're here in the service. You can give in the offering bucket. We're not passing buckets right now, but you can drop it in either the bucket or the drop box on the way out. You can give at the giving kiosk. And then those of you online joining us or here, you can give at avalonchurch.net forward slash give, or you can text 84321. And so I want to thank you for your faithfulness to give. Um, we're going to be talking about this, uh, how much of a blessing you have been and uh, we're very excited about the future and can't wait for what God's doing in our church and in your life. We're very, very excited about it, okay? But anyway, thank you for being here today. God bless you. Um, I'll be down front if you'd like to come by and say hi, if you have a question or whatever. I'll be happy to talk with you. Those of you that joined us online, please fill out a Next Step card so I can communicate with you and get to know you and meet you. And God bless you. We love you. And we'll see you again next week.
Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.